Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to finish up our Year of Sanderson coverage with a final ranking of the Secret Project books. So we're in December now and that means that the final swag box is about to go out. I didn't get the swag boxes so we're just going to talk about the Secret Projects themselves, the actual books. So I've talked about this in a non-spoiler setting over on Murphy Napier's channel, but I want to kind of do my ranking here and kind of do full spoilers. And also I've asked her and Bookborn and Matt from Matt Fantasy Reads to give um, their opinions and their rankings too. So they'll be in the video as well. So as always, make sure you hit the like button, subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. And if you want to support the channel in another way, you can check out the Patreon. It's linked in the description below. So as always... Let's begin. All right, so I want to rank this starting from the least favorite going to my favorite. So we're going to start off with number four just right away. So my least favorite of the Secret Project books has to be The Frugal Wizard's Guide for Surviving Medieval England. So this book, um, while mm, this book kind of, most of it just doesn't work for me. The majority of it just simply does not work for me. Even though I really applaud Brandon for like stretching his skill set and really trying new things. He tries to make use of the white wall trope, creating a protagonist who has no memory of who they are or their, the events that they're thrown into. So I like that idea because I really like the Born Supremacy movies and stuff like that. And I know it's a really hard kind of trope to play with in any kind of setting. So putting in this sci-fi kind of um, setting is probably like extra difficult. But the main issue with this type of storytelling for me is that the character doesn't know who they are. So it becomes very hard for me to grow attached to them because as they're trying to discover who they are, specifically in this story, as he's trying to discover who he is, he's making guesses and assumptions and stuff. And every time he does, I kind of latch on to those guesses and assume, okay, that's who he is, or maybe it's related to that. And then I try to inform myself based on that. But then it happens a couple times and we realize, oh, that's not who he is. That's not what he did and stuff like that. So it takes almost two thirds, if not more, um, of, the, of the book before we really know who the character is. And as a result, that makes every other character in the book incredibly thin and just like, boring like just plain boring like the villain like is completely boring because we take so time so much time trying to learn who the main character is that we have no time to develop the villain we can't develop any of the side characters or anything else like this so it just kind of falls very very flat for me but the thing about it i do like i do like this concept of multiversal um commerce you know like this idea of tourism um going to the multiverse even though i think there are some very very uncomfortable implications of the idea that someone owns a alternate universe so they can just go and change everything about that universe like having zero care or regard for the people that live in that universe regardless if it's less real whatever that means so there's just a lot of ideas in there that are kind of cool in concept but i don't think they're really well executed so that's why uh, frugal wizard has to be my least favorite so let's go ahead and go straight to number three. Number three is Yumi and the Nightmare Painter. So I'm an artist, as you can tell by the paintings. I love art. I absolutely adore art. So like the part of this book that I really, really love is all the art influences and stuff. I love that painter is a painter, even though he's a very different kind of painter than I am. But um, I really love those aspects of the story. I love the um, fact that it takes place in the Cosmere. I love the narrative device that's used the way Hoyt is used in the story. I love the expansion of magic systems that we're um, kind of familiar with and using them in different ways. I, so basically, I love all the world building. I love the magic systems. And I even think all the characters are really, really good and interesting. They're both... Um, Yumi and um, Painter are very interesting characters and they're very, like their jobs and stuff is just really cool. I really like all the concepts around them. But the one of the main things about the story is the fact that these two characters are in a romance and they end up together. But I think the romance was done like too subtly. I think um, it may be the Eastern influences in the way in which um, romances are not, you know, quite done the way they're done here. Or I don't know, maybe it's just personal perception kind of thing. But I didn't feel any chemistry between the characters. I didn't even understand that we were really going towards an actual relationship until more than two thirds into the book. And then it felt like we were setting up this situation of realizing that they can't be together because the scenario that Brandon created, which I thought was really fascinating, the way it integrates the magic system with the way the world building works and with the way uh, time can kind of be displaced without any actual time travel and stuff. Like I just really like all that stuff. 
But by the time we get to, you know, towards the end, I kind of assume he was setting up this thing of like star-crossed lovers who aren't going to be able to be together. And it kind of felt like he was kind of leaning that way because the story kind of ends and then he um, does the epilogue and then bring back Yumi and allow them to be together. So it feels like it's a tag on. It doesn't feel very committed. A lot of the ideas in there don't feel like they're 100% like committed to. So while I am um, personally very much a world building magic system kind of reader, like not even heavy on plot and character, I think the um, main part of the plot was the development of the romance and that really just completely fell apart for me. So that just kind of um, sits negatively with me and kind of the way in which the characters perceive their jobs because their jobs are both art based along with kind of um, investiture based. So the way the attitude, um, painter's attitude towards his job kind of made me feel less excited about his job. So that kind of detracted some of my enjoyment. And um, we didn't get enough of Yumi stuff, kind of, in my opinion. So like just the things that I was really enjoying, I didn't get enough of. And the stuff I wasn't really um, getting apparently was a big part of the story. So it just kind of left me like very much up in the air, kind of, you know, all over the place with it a lot. But I do really, really enjoy the things in the story that I do like. So that leads us to number two. So number two, my second favorite um, secret project book of the year is definitely The Sunlit Man. So The Sunlit Man, while the plot itself is actually like very, very generic, it is like very straightforward and quite generic um, to the point where the main character doesn't even like... Um, stick around <laughs> um, the actual world that's on there is really fascinating from like an astrophysics perspective because it's kind of implied that it's like maybe two thirds to a third the size of the moon their entire planet and that if they are on their little flying ships and stuff as they go they can outpace the rotation of the planet which just in my mind is just like wow because I don't think that would be habitable i mean but investiture makes things habitable that shouldn't be habitable so you know there's that but like whoa like just that idea of it i thought it was really fascinating i kind of wish we would have got more of it it was always kind of a bit of a background element and it didn't seem to really affect the characters as much as i would have liked even though the entire nature of the title has to do with you know that aspect of it so there's just parts of it that i wish kind of were uh, more emphasized but the stuff that we did get emphasis on, I just adore anyway. So I like this idea of a nomadic character kind of being a wanderer and just like going around and stuff because it's kind of a tropish thing. It's been done numerous times in numerous ways and stuff by many, many writers. But I love the fact that Brandon kind of um, played with it here. So last year we got a reveal with the Kickstarter about the miniatures of a character named Zellion. So we went a full year without knowing who Zellion was and stuff. Everybody had guesses and stuff. So it was really interesting to see that this character in this book was Zellion. So that got me excited. And then we learn who Zellion is. We learned that Zellion is actually Sigzel from the Stormlight Archives. And that right there just kind of solidified it for me. I was like, okay, this is awesome. And then like that part was really cool. And I was already really enjoying that but then we got um all these hints and stuff all these like cosmere lore hints all the stormlight hints and like all this kind of stuff so i really really enjoy that stuff i enjoyed everything about sigzel as a character i enjoyed all of the hints to his background and stuff all the stuff that we didn't see since you know we've seen him last in stormlight i really liked all that stuff i liked all the stuff around that but the plot of the story is so incredibly generic. And it feels like even Brandon understood how generic it was that he didn't even feel hyper attached to the characters. Because similar to a lot of these types of stories, um, like the Seventh Samurai or um, 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 what was that other one? The one made of the, the, the last, uh, it doesn't matter. It's going to bug me now. <laughs> but um, the Seventh Samurai, there's a Western movie made that's based on it. But anyway, like Wolves of the Collar by Stephen King, same kind of thing. Group of people kind of just wander in town. The town needs their help, and then they um, help, and then they just kind of go away. Like, it's kind of like that. It's, um... We go through the entire story, like Sigzel helps them, and he does everything he can, and he does the cool hero thing, and he's of course like, he has this um, ability, which I can only assume is else calling, he has the ability to just skip to worlds and stuff like that, but he needs a certain amount of investiture, so he's constantly low on investiture the entire time. So we get all these kind of hints at stuff that he can do, but he doesn't have enough investiture to actually do it, so it's just kind of all this like, ah, he's he's almost, he's like, he, he's stat maxed out, but like, he can't make use of it, so it's like, 
like, oh, it's kind of frustrating, but it's fascinating. But then, like, when we finally get to the end of the story, towards the end of the story, when he does get all the investiture he needs, he just he just skips. He just goes. Like, so it happens in such a way that I was, like, dumbfounded because I'm like, does he even technically know that everything worked out? Because he just kind of was fighting the guy or whatever. Um, and it just, like... Um, during the absorption and stuff of the, the sun heart and whatnot, he just kind of, you know, gets crazy amount of investiture, especially after having given up Ox and stuff. And then he just kind of, um, he gets a bunch of investiture and leaves. Like, he just kind of leaves. Like, so it's like we don't even get to see the end of the conflict that he was in because it was happening on, like, his front and the people's front that he was helping out. And then it just kind of resolves and then he just goes. And I was like, what? Like, so I guess I was just, you know, taking that as a, um, that stuff's not that important. The more, the greater emphasis on the story is about Sigza, is about Zelly, and about how he's just a wanderer now, about all the stuff he's been through and everything that he's experienced or whatever, um, just kind of has him in this situation where he can't stand still because we learn that he's being chased by the Night Brigade, which definitely has to do with Trinity because, I remember at some point Brandon said Threnody, or the next Threnody book will be like Night Brigade or something like that. So I, it was definitely connected. But um, So he's like just off and running. So I just like that idea. I like an idea of a character like that. But again, it, it's not my number one because the plot and the story around it is just so incredibly generic. So that takes us to number one. My absolute favorite of the secret projects, my favorite Actually, it might be my favorite, like, intro to the Cosmere book, period. Because it's just so much fun. It's so effervescent. It's just so well-crafted. That, of course, is Tress of the Emerald Sea. So, Tress is so, so good. I love it to death. I love all the different aspects of it. I love all the characters. I think they're so, so well done. And just this idea, like, I use the term Dugs now for, like, just uh, people in my office that I don't know. It's like, oh, the Dugs over there. But nobody gets what I'm talking about. So it's just, like, whatever, <laughs> that kind of thing. But um, I just love those, like, kind of, um, just the world in which he created, essentially. I love the fact that um, Tress is such an interesting protagonist. She's an interesting main character. She does things that... Um, most character, most people while reading would be kind of yelling at the main character to go and do, and then she does it. So that's just like a really cool subversion in the cool direction kind of thing, because most people will subvert an expectation in kind of a more dramatic way. This is like in a, oh wow, kind of way. I don't know if that explanation makes any sense, but I thought it was so, so fun. I love the story. I love the characters. I love the little quirks and fo foibles about um, Tress, too. I love that she collects cups and stuff. I thought that was a lot of fun. I love her relationship with Huck. And um, Brandon says in like the end note and stuff of the story that it was heavily influenced by Princess Bride. So before reading this book, I had never seen Princess Bride. So I had no context for that at all. I was just like going through it, listening to the audiobook and just having the time of my life, just really, really enjoying this story. Loving everything about the Aethers, loving everything about just the idea of being like a pirate and like a pirate ship on not water. <laughs> just that concept alone is just so fun to me, just that idea. And then I spent so much time imagining how the world looks. If there are multiple, you know, aether seas and there's like 12 aethers so i'm in my head like is this some giant pie situation like i couldn't even like imagine it. and i love the art in the book too like i love the art in pretty much all the books especially like yumi but like the art and this was really cool it gave a really great visual detail because there's like one where it's like a page spread and the the line between the verdant sea and the crimson sea is the page break between the two pages. So it's this hard delineation, this hard line of the uh, two different color seas and stuff. And I just thought that was really, really cool. I like that stuff so, so much. And because I hadn't seen Princess Bride, I had no concept for the idea of the twist that would happen. So when it's the, we get the twist and find out Huck was the, you know, the mouse was actually her uh, uh, boyfriend, fiance, but, they were, you know, hesitant to give any kind of labels or anything to it because they were just mostly like flirting, lovey kind of thing. But yeah, I didn't even see that coming or anything. And then so just that part and stuff is really, really cool. But then when we get to like the dragon and stuff, we get a canonical appearance of dragon still. And we like learn just all kinds of stuff. It's just so fun. If you want to hear me gush more about it, you can check out the review I have up on the channel. 
Same thing for the other three as well. If you want to hear me talk in more detail about the specific issues I had with some of the other secret projects, you can, of course, check out those reviews. So now let's see what um, my friends here over on YouTube um, think about it. So as I said in the beginning of the video, I have some friends from around YouTube, and I wanted to see what their ranking was and why their number one was their number one. So first up, let's hear what Matt thinks. What is his opinion? What's his ranking? What does he think? Hey, what's up, Cam? Thanks so much for having me. This is Matt from Matt's Fantasy Book Reviews, and let me go through my top four and then talk about my number one for just a brief moment. Um, so, my number four book, which I think is going to be a pretty common one here, is The Frugal Wizard's Handbook for Surviving Overly Long Book Names. I forget the whole title. Um, number three is Yumi and the Nightmare Painter. Uh, number two is Tress of the Emerald Sea. And number one is The Sunlit Man. And I know The Sunlit Man uh, doesn't have as much fanfare as Tress of the Emerald Sea did, but man, it worked for me. Uh, I don't want to spoil anything. I don't know if this is spoiler free, but you know, the main character of this is one that, uh, that I knew and loved from something previously that Brandon Sanderson's done. So I love seeing things from this person's perspective. Um, but more than anything, I love the pace of this one, not just compared to Sanderson books, but fantasy books in general. I mean, Sanderson especially likes to do a slow burn until he gets to these major epic moments that he's set up all the pieces for. He said, knock those dominoes over. And Sunlight Man, he just put the pedal to the metal and didn't really let up until the end of the book. It was a wonderfully different change change of pace that just works so well for me with wonderful little twists, an amazing world, um, and it just filled my head with imagination. So uh, thanks, Steve, so much for having me on, and happy reading to you. Thanks a lot, Matt. I really appreciate you coming on to the channel. So yeah, that's a really, really cool point. I really agree with him on the ideas that he brought up on The Sunlit Man. The pacing was really, really well um, constructed, and I just really like the way Brandon handled it. And I'm really um, happy that we got somebody that automatically like has a different ranking than I did, because as far as I can tell on the internet, a lot of the rankings are quite similar. Like his number four and stuff is also the same as mine. So next up, let's see what Murphy thinks. Hey, Cam. So my personal ranking of the secret projects would be Tress, then Yumi, then The Sunlit Man, and then Wizards. Don't expect me to remember the title for that one. The reason Tress is my personal favorite is because, first of all, it's nautical, and that's always a win for me, but it's a nautical adventure with pirates. Oh my goodness, this book was written for me. But it's a really fresh take on all of those things. It's something that's so very Sanderson while also being a really different style for Sanderson. You could tell that he pushed himself to do something really unique and different while still being signature Sanderson. I love Tress as a protagonist. I love the relationship dynamics between the crew after she joined up with them. I thought all the Easter eggs from other Cosmere connections were so much fun to speculate over and to try to find and identify. And it actually led me down the rabbit hole of reading The Emperor's Soul for the first time because of a reference in Tress, which was also a delight. Plus, I really love that Sanderson changed up his prose style to match that whimsical, adventurous feeling of the book. Overall, it was a win for me. I think Yumi had the best artwork of the four, but Tress has my heart. Thanks, Murphy. That's awesome. So yeah, I knew that our ranking would be kind of similar because uh, we definitely have the same favorite number one. And I couldn't agree more basically with all her points. Like Tress is just so good. We could gush about it all day. But let's finally let's hear what um, Bookboard has to say. Let's hear her ranking and see what her number one was. Hey, Cam, thanks for asking me about my opinion on the ranking order for Brand Sanction Secret Projects. I'll start with my number four, which is The Frugal Wizard's Guide to Surviving Medieval England. Nailed it. I, I think this is kind of a very popular opinion. This was my least favorite. I do think it's really fun. I loved the FAQ sections. Overall, I think for the character arc that Sanderson was trying to go for, it just felt way too rushed in the end, and I didn't necessarily connect to it. Fun book, but I only rated this one three stars. Number three, and this might be a little unpopular, but it's The Sunlit Man. I did give this four stars. I did like The Sunlit Man. I obviously loved the Cosmere connections and love that we get to follow Sigzel. However, I just personally felt that Sigzel didn't sound like himself compared to the Stormlight Archive. It didn't sound like his voice, in my opinion. Now, I know a lot of people have said, well, it has been a really long time. He's obviously going to change. And I agree with you. But there is another character in Stormlight who we see in another series. I'm trying to be vague on purpose. I don't want to spoil it for anyone. 
who it's been years and she is very different than what she was in her original book, but she still feels like an extension of herself. It felt like a natural progression. In this case, for me personally, Sigzil didn't. And so that made me struggle a little bit with the voice of this book. I felt like it was too similar to the way Hoyd sounded in the other two novels. And I was hoping for something just a little different. However, like I said, four stars, I still really enjoyed this one. Now, the differences between two and one is a hair's breadth. I gave them both 4.5, but in the end, one just slightly edged out the other. So my number two is Yumi and the Nightmare Painter. I absolutely love this book. It was so magical. I think it has catapulted into one of my favorite magic systems of the Cosmere so far. I love the two main characters. The art is incredible. I would say the only couple of things about this one was just some of the romantic scenes. You know, I'm like a grumpy romance person. Just didn't quite do it for me. However, like definitely one of my favorites of Sanderson's. I love this one. And so yes, that leaves as my number one, Tress of the Emerald Sea. You know, this one, I think the reason it edges it out just slightly is I love how different prose-wise it is for Sanderson, very fairy tale in nature. I think it being the first secret project really took us all by surprise. We didn't know what to expect. And then we got this like lovely, just heartwarming story. I also think this one slightly edges out Yumi only because I have such positive memories surrounding it with Brandon's book club. I do think that gives it the edge out because I did rate it 4.5 stars before and I even knew any of that was happening. But I think that those like positive memories I have with this will always make this an incredibly special book to me. I can't wait to hear everybody else's ranking. I thought the secret projects were such a fun thing and I'll definitely miss it. The year of Sanderson was very fun. Thanks for having me, Cam. Bye. Thanks, Bookborn. Yeah, so we have another lover of Tress of the Emerald Sea. It is definitely the best one that Brandon released this year. Um, and at least three out of four of our opinions. So yeah, I definitely enjoyed it. And thanks a lot to Matt, Murphy, and Bookborn for being a part of this video. I really appreciate it. So of course, everyone, let me know in the comments down below, what is your ranking of the secret projects if you read all four of them? Let me know how you felt about them in the comments down below. Full spoilers, open spoilers. Um, but be careful about spoiling other stuff in the Cosmere, you know, be respectful of other people. Um, so yeah, um, with that being said, please make sure you hit the like button, subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. And if you're interested, you can check out the Patreon. The link is in the description below. And as always, I will talk to y'all next time. Peace.